If you have a, a Bible in front of you, you want to turn to our reading today, um, it is found on page 1037. It is Luke chapter 8. Uh, we're on to the second of our parable series. And this one, um, in your Bibles, it will probably be noted down as the parable of the sower. However, I think that's a bit misleading. It is the parable of the four soils. And we're going to pick up in verse 4, um, as Jesus gathers a large crowd to himself along the shoreline. Let us hear God's word. Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 4. While a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told them this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on the rock. When it came up, the plant withered because it, there was no moisture. Other seed fell on the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on the good soil. It came up and it yielded a crop, a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, He who has an ear, let him hear. His disciples asked him what the parable meant. He said, The knowledge of the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that those seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable of this, uh, the, of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes it away from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear. But as they go on through their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Amen, and may God bless to us the reading from his word. Amen for the disciples. They had gathered with Christ and they were heading along the shoreline and many a crowd was gathering. People from town after town came to hear him. And he said to them this parable, a sower went out to sow his seed and as he sowed some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot and the birds of the air devoured it and some fell on the rock and as it grew up, it withered away, because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorn, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell in the good soil, and it grew up and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It is a parable that we know oh so well. We could probably recite it in our sleep. We were taught it in Sunday school. And we've probably heard it preached on a number of times, usually around harvest. But I wonder, have we ever sat down and just picked it apart and understood what is going on here? Well, what we see in, in the passage itself is, is in verses 11 through 15, Jesus explains privately to the, to the disciples what it meant. But what are we to take from it as a church today? How are we to interpret the parable as disciples of Christ? Well, as we unpack it, um, I think it's worth noting down a few things that we can often mistake um, or don't realize about this parable. Firstly, and, and most importantly, the sower is not us and will never be us. The sower is God himself by his Spirit. So often we can think that we are the sower and we are preaching to the soils and we miss the point of the parable. Secondly, the seed is the word of God 
his scriptures. Jesus tells his disciples that in verse 11. And the seed never changes. So often in our world, we see people take the word of God, that seed, and change it to make it suit their own needs. Recently, I was horrified to see um, a church within Northern Ireland taking the word of God, taking one verse, and telling its church how they were to vote in the EU referendum when the verse had nothing at all to do with it. With God as the sower and the seed as his word, the message is never going to change. It is always going to be the same. Saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and to the glory of God alone. And finally, all of mankind is the soil, or is one type of soil. The soil illustrates our hearts, and which soil we are is a question that we need to ask ourselves. So with that in mind, let us unpack this parable. And we're going to use the second half of the passage that we read today, verses 11 through to 15, where Jesus expands and explains each soil. Firstly, what we find is that we have hard hearts. Jesus says in verse 12, The ones along the path are those who have heard. The devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. If you go back to ancient Palestine, a field for them uh, would have looked something like this, which will appear on the screen. Yep. There would have been narrow strips of land and paths up either side of it. And they became beaten down as hard as pavements by feet, hooves, and the wheels that used them. And as the seed landed on these, it would merely just bounce off the path. It would be swept back and forth by the winds of nature and commerce, and it's easily picked up by the birds of the air, as we saw in the video for a quick meal. As Jesus speaks, he uses this illustration to talk about those who, on hearing the word, have hard hearts. Like the path, when it comes to God's word, it just bounces off. And this can be because of their lifestyles, what they believe themselves, their own hostilities to the message, or even past experiences with God's people. And their hearts have become hard against him. And as we are told here, when the word is then preached, Satan comes along and he cozies up beside the person and he says, you don't really need to hear that. That's just not important to you. You know, who's God anyway to tell you that you are a sinner? You know, you're a good person. You do good things. You don't need this. You can get on and do your thing your way. You're all right. And he comes along again, and as a result, the word doesn't penetrate. It just bounces off the heart, and it has no effect. And in all honesty, it breaks hearts to see people like that. It is absolutely heartbreaking. And the scary thing is it can even be within the church. When we think that we don't need God's grace and that by ticking a few boxes we can save ourselves, Or it can be in some area of our lives where the seed doesn't penetrate because we think that it's none of God's business, that part of my life. And the sad thing is that even within the church, we can lead people to be hard-hearted by the way that we act towards them. A so-called Christian can act in such a non-Christian way that it turns people off God. Mahatma Gandhi, I think I've said the line before, came out with the line, I love your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. Because your Christians are nothing like your Christ. And we can make people hard-hearted by the way we act towards them. So what are we to do with hard hearts? Well, firstly, we need to repent of our own hard-heartedness. When we refuse to let God's word speak to a particular part of our lives and let it be changed. And we need to repent of the times when we have caused someone else to become hard-hearted because of the way we have acted towards them in Christ's name. But then we also need to pray. We need to pray that God would break the ground, would break it up completely, and it will be painful, at times more painful than others, but it has to be done. We need to pray that God would take away our hardness and others so that his word can penetrate deeply And we can see Christ change people. 
Then secondly, we have the shallow soil or the shallow heart. Verse 13, uh, Jesus says, and the, one, or the, and the ones on the rock are those who, when hearing the word, receive it with joy. But these, are, these have no root. They believe for a while and in time of testing fall away. The shallow soil speaks of a shallow heart. If you went to Israel today and you saw what they call shallow soil or what they understood to be shallow soil, it was a soil that had a very thin layer of topsoil and straight underneath was a layer of bedrock or a layer of limestone. And as the seed penetrated the soil into the shallow soil, it sprang up quickly because the first rains were still held in the soil. The problem was the soil wasn't deep enough to hold enough moisture for the plant to grow. And it quickly leaves the soil and the plant starts to wither and die. And it will not survive until the second rains. And this is a lot like those within the church and without the church who say that they believe in God. But when their faith is tested, they abandon the God they believe in and fall away. We can often call them Sunday Christians or those who are converts and not disciples. In the good times, they are happy to believe in God. But when they are pushed a bit further, their maturity and depth is not there. And they just walk away. And we really, what we find is this person is not unlike the hard heart. They have shallow hearts and the hardness is just below the surface. They are happy to receive God's word. They're happy to receive his grace. But they don't particularly want to have to do the hard work. They don't want to live for him or give their lives to him. And once the heat of the sun beats down or the storms of life close in, well, they just walk away. Because the God that they believed in is not the God of Scripture. And he's not going to help them. And it's sad when we see it. Someone who comes to the Lord full of enthusiasm but then suddenly disappears when the hard times come. Their faith is tested and it crumbles. And we need to seek to pray for those with shallow hearts. That God's word would penetrate through the rock and pass through the initial top layer and into the deep soil beneath. But there's also a warning to us ourselves who claim to be faithful believers. We need to be planted deep in the rock. We need to have deep roots and mature in faith so that we will not be blown about by many different things in this world. Then thirdly, we read of the third soil and really it's the infested heart that's talked about. Verse 14 says, and as for what fell among the thorns, there are those who hear, but As they go on their way, they are choked by the cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. This is an infested heart. And as we explore it, I want to show you a short video clip. It's from the movie Finding Nemo. Uh, We're definitely going to need the sound for this, because otherwise you'll not get uh, what he's saying. Um, But you probably know it from the aquarium, and I'll just play it now, hopefully. Would you please? And uh, I'm going to need a few more buttons. Okay. Hello, little fella. <laughs> Beauty, isn't he? I found that guy struggling for life out in the reef and I saved him. So, has that Novocaine kicked in yet? My bubbles! He likes bubbles. 
got to do with an invested heart. Well, uh, this week when I was away in London, one of the preachers, a man named John D. Alcock, um, got up to speak, and he was speaking on a passage just earlier in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 5. And in it, what we see is Jesus calls Simon. He gets into the boat with Simon. Simon's had a hard night fishing, and he gets in the boat, and he preaches to those in front of him. And then he gets Simon to take the boat out, and Simon puts the net down into the water because Jesus told him to. And he pulls up this massive catch of fish. And Jesus is there telling him that he wants him to be fishers of men. That the church is called to be a fishing boat, gathering people in and seeking to point them towards Christ. However, what he pointed out was at times, and it becomes more evident as time goes on, that the church has become an aquarium in some places. What does he mean? Well, we have become about, all, about making all our fish happy in the aquarium. We go out and we'll, we'll buy them little castles. We'll, we'll buy them um, plants to go in their little aquarium. Um, and we'll do everything to make sure that the fish are happy in their aquarium. And the result is, as we saw in the video, the fish can become obsessed with bubbles. And in the church, this can happen so easily. And we've got to ask the question, in a hundred years' time, what things will really matter to the church? Things that, that relate to the little castle or to the bubbles are things like which pew is mine, what instruments are played, how many hymns or psalms we sing, what the minister wears, what he doesn't wear, um, how you find him on a, on a morning when you call up at the house and he's only just got out of bed in his pajamas where the communion table sits, where the organ is, how the church is decorated, etc., etc. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. And these are the bubbles in the video. And the problem is, these bubbles can distract so easily. They can infest our lives. If you look at that yellow fish in the video, he is completely obsessed with this bubble machine. He's so obsessed that when Nemo arrives in the tank, he is terrified. And there could be people walking to the church and they're terrified. But this yellowfish is so obsessed with the bubbles that he doesn't care about Nemo. He's only obsessed with his little bubbles. Then what we see later on is another fish um, explains that it's not good to be inside this box. Fish are not designed to be here. He's not listening. The bubbles have taken over his life. And when the bubbles turn toxic and he chokes on them, he still is obsessed with his bubbles. He still has to have his bubbles. He misses the fact that he is stuck in an aquarium, but he's quite happy with his little bubbles. He doesn't realize that he belongs in the sea and there's so much more out there. There's so much more to what he is about. And in the church we can do the same. We can become obsessed with the bubbles and we can miss the main point and the reason we meet as a church and the faith that we have. And this is what happens when Jesus talks about the weeds getting in. They infest our heart. They take our focus off the main thing and the devil laughs in delight because we're focused on our bubbles. We're not focused on Christ and declaring his message, we've turned the fishing boat into an aquarium. And we need to ask ourselves, are we amazed by the gospel, or are we obsessed with bubbles? We can so easily miss the truth of the gospel, that God has sent his only son into this world to save us, the sinner. And before that, we were on a one-way train to hell, and there was no getting off but God has made a way. And the reality is there are still those who are stuck on that train. And we are called to pull them off. And this morning our main focus is to be on the truth. If it is not on that truth that those without Christ go to hell and that we have the message that will save, then we are just a fish obsessed with his bubbles. And I urge each one of us this morning, 
if we are obsessed with bubbles, to look beyond them, to see the great truth that we are missing in the gospel and repent of our infested hearts. It lurks inside each one of us, and we need to be so careful that it does not grow up and choke us. We need to cut the root of the weed off at its core because it will so easily rack our faith and the reason that we meet as a church. And honestly, one thing that I take away massively from the conference this week was a man named Dick Lucas. Um, he got up to speak at the very last day. He's in his late 90s, and he can still preach faithfully from God's word. Pray, thanks be to God. But he said one important thing to remember as a church. It is God who builds his church, and we are called to be part of it. It is not us that builds it. We may seek to do things to help people come in to and understand God's faith, but he's the one that saves. May we seek to get out of our aquarium with our bubbles and actually be the fishers of men that God has called us to be. Then fourthly and, and finally, there is the good soil or the good heart. Jesus says, as for the good soil, they are those that hearing the word hold fast to it with a good and honest heart and bear fruit with patience. What makes a good soil? I am no gardener nor farmer, but I'm sure if you ask a farmer or a gardener what makes a good soil, they will tell you that it needs to be full of nutrients. It needs to be cleared of weeds. It needs to be ready for seeding and it needs to be soft and moist. It has to allow the seed to bur burrow deep into it and allow the roots to grasp a hold of it. But it requires ongoing work. It can be good soil one day and infested the next so easily. But it needs to be maintained. It needs to be watered. It needs to be fertilized. For a good heart, the same is exactly true. It needs to be soft and open to receive God's word to allow that seed to come into it and then hold fast to it, allowing it to penetrate every single part of our lives. We are called to delight in the gospel of the message of grace and allow that seed of God's word to settle in us and grow and bear fruit in its time. But we also need to rely on God to help us grow. It is this great tension. We are called to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are called to live for God, but at the same time we must allow him to work. He provides the water. He provides the nutrients that we need from his word. And it means having a daily relationship with him, being in prayer with him. That is how we depend on God, is handing all our cares over to him and allowing him to guide us. We are to listen to his word as his spirit speaks from it. We are to walk daily with him, taking what we learn on a Sunday and having it in the car on a Monday morning as we go off to work. And with patience and perseverance, we will see fruit in our own lives and in others. We are told that as that plant yields fruit, it came up and yielded fruit a hundred times more than was sown. As God penetrates our heart and changes us, our faith will shine forth for him. And please do not be discouraged this morning if you feel at times that there's no fruit growing. Remember, soil goes through many different seasons in a year, and it changes the soil. There are times when nothing will grow. In the winter, it goes into hibernation. But come the spring, the first shoots appear. By summer, the plant is growing, and by harvest, we have the fruit. God is always at work, even when we don't see it. We need to learn to be patient and we need to persevere. Because God is always making us mature into Christ Jesus as we let him teach us and guide us. And my prayer for us today is that we would seek to be that good soil. That we would seek to delight in the gospel message of grace. And seek to let it shine out so that we may share it with others so that much fruit may be produced 
And God would use that to grow his church. And let us rejoice that we are made part of that when we trust in him. What a wonderful truth it is to know that we are children of the living God when we live for him and trust in his saving grace and help to point others to it. So as we close our time this morning, I want to leave you with a thought. In the parable, we have four soils. All of mankind falls into one of the four soils. Three of the soils don't work. The hard-hearted soil. The soil that is shallow and when tested fades away. And the one that is infested, none of them produce fruit. But there's one that does. And it is the one that is rooted in God's grace and in his word. It is the one that can make a difference in our lives. Let us pray that we have that good soil heart. But I ask this final question. Which soil are you?